welcome everybody to Techno 2024. And I will tell you that this is, um, this is amazing. We have more people here this year than we've had in the past. And we are really excited to what we have planned for you today. Um, here's the mission for today. The vibe is here. You just need to sit back, relax, have fun. Um, these are some of our presenters that they thought I was joking when I said you are coming to the Malibu of the Midwest. They didn't believe me, so I had to take them down to the beach and show them that this is the Malibu of the Midwest, Sheboygan. And we realized that this is actually trademarked. So we're like, who trademarked Midwest? You know, Malibu of the Midwest. So this was last night and um, these presenters are ready to really knock your socks off today. We're going to start off with um, a couple words from Jamie Schramm, who really started this partnership here at UWGB Sheboygan. Um, we started out, this was probably uh, seven years ago, um, a half a day conference. We had probably 45 to 50 teachers that would show up. And this is what it has expanded to. And we grew out of the space. And so we partnered with Jamie. He's been so accommodating. And I'm going to let him say a few words. Good morning, everybody. And welcome to campus. Um, I'm going to focus my remarks to all my fellow Gen Xers out there. So this is kind of going to be dedicated to all of you. As I was uh, driving into campus this morning, um, couldn't help but think of that great 1980s philosopher, Jeff Spicoli, who uh, graduated from Ridgemont High, that esteemed education place, and was trying to determine if today was Mr. Hand's time, my time, or our time. But I think uh, I came down and decided that this is our time, right? This is our time to celebrate all things tech, to learn, to be creative, to be curious, and it's certainly time for all of us Gen Xers, right? Because we grew up listening to how awesome our parents were, those baby boomers, right? And how they single-handedly created pop culture and all things awesome in the 60s and 70s. And we were kind of squeezed in between that. And then for some of us, our kids' generation, the millennials, right? Millennials, millennials, millennials. That's all we heard about. And how they're going to single-handedly save the planet from destruction. But we learned some skills along the way, right? We got to use things called typewriters, right? Um, yeah, absolutely, and I brought a few props along today. We actually got to play vinyl albums from a band called Bon Jovi, right? We grew up listening to that, yeah, yeah. And we had that wonderful, you know, in between albums and CDs, we had cassette tapes, and we learned the skill that when your cassette tape stuck to that tape head, you had to get the pencil out and rewind it. It's a really valuable life skill. We learned those things, right? We know how to use rotary phones. You know, we saw the advent of the first cell phones and my goodness, right? At one point, cell phones had gotten this small and we got to use these kind of phones and then some of us are like, why are they getting bigger again? Then we had the first iPhone, I bet, None of us in the room could probably use this one because we've all forgotten how simplistic it was and how it works, right? But we saw changing technology, right? And we're grateful for those experiences that we had along the way. Um, and we even, you know, had some uncomfortable moments. I was at an event like this one time and I was talking about effective communication and how sometimes it helps to write out our words so that we can see the impact they have on other people. And I said, you know, writing out your words is kind of uncomfortable, like those of us from my generation when we had to call someone up on the phone and ask them out on a date. <laughs> that kind of uncomfortable. And one of those bright young lady from the millennial generation raises her hand and she says, Mr. Schramm, we would never do that. We would text them. And I'm like, oh, I'm getting old. <laughs> but that's okay. But just show us how technology changes, right? So an event like this, when we all gather here, I'm reminded they don't happen by mistake. They don't happen by accident, right? Some really great people worked really hard. Mike and his team, as he mentioned, I don't know, four or five years ago, right, as we were coming out of COVID or right in the middle of COVID, Mike goes, can we grab lunch at Culver's? And I'm like, absolutely. And he goes, I have this really crazy idea. And I'm like, I love those crazy ideas. 
And uh, it's how we got here today, right? So thank you, Mike, to your team, to all the guest speakers. I mean, we've had over 1,200 educators, I think, in this room over the last four or five years. And if you think of how you all go out and inspire great minds and inspire today's learners and tomorrow's leaders, that's a pretty awesome thing. So we think about impact, right? And all the talented people that come together to make this happen. Um, so enjoy the day, right? Be okay with being uncomfortable. I've never had this problem, but you know, if you're the smartest person in the room, find a different room to go into, join a different, join a different group. And at the end of the day, just remember, right? Have fun, learn all things tech. And I'll close with, uh, you know, what Jeff Spicoli would have told us, right? All we need are some tasty waves, a cool buzz, and we'll be just fine. So we're gonna be just fine today. Enjoy the day and welcome to campus. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. And Jamie talks about Gen X, and I had people looking at my shirt, and they're like, what does that mean? <laughs> I dated myself. How many know what this shirt means? You're gonna need a bigger boat. Jaws, if you haven't seen Jaws, you gotta, you gotta see Jaws. So that's the mystery of my shirt. Um, I do have to, I guess, feature one other fashion uh, that came across today. And Jamie, could you stand up for a second? I don't know if you can see Jamie's shorts, but, well, yeah, I don't know. But he walked in with these shorts and I looked, I'm like, what is on that short? And it's my face. <laughs> so I guess I feel I've made it when I'm on somebody's shorts, so. Thanks, Jamie. For, I appreciate that. Uh, next, I'm going to invite up our new superintendent for the Sheboygan Area School Dis District, Jake Conrath. Good morning. Um, Mike stole my thunder. I have no idea who this gentleman is, but I was going to bring him up on stage and show his shorts to everyone. He, he did um, offer to auction them off, so... <laughs> I think we can do two things today. Uh, one, we can learn a lot, and two, we can solve our budget deficit for Sheboygan Area School District. So um, there'll be raffle tickets. Uh, we'll start them at 100 a pop, and we'll, we'll go from there. So um, now, in all sincerity, thank you so much for being here today. This is what uh, I think the Sheboygan Area School District does, right? We're here with our colleagues today. We're learning from each other. Uh, and for many of us, we could be outside enjoying a, a, a nice summer day, but instead we're in here getting better because we want to serve our kids and, and do better by our kids. So um, I started out in this district 17, 18 years ago as a business and IT teacher. Um, <coughs> technology's always been so important to me, and, and you know what you see. It, it, it makes your jobs easier and better, but it also engages kids so much and gets kids thinking in a way that um, we can't otherwise. So it's just great to have everyone here today. It's great to learn from our colleagues. Um, it's great to have your face photoshopped with a really cool jacket. Um, <laughs> if he could have added hair, we would have been in a much better place. But <laughs> maybe next year. Can I have hair next year, Mark? Or Mike, it's been a long time. Uh, so thank you for being here, truly. It's a, it's a great event. Learn from your colleagues. Uh, love the energy, and this is always kind of the start, right, to the school year. So welcome back to the 24-25 school year. We look forward to great things happening in our district. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. I also have to uh, recognize the people who have pulled this all together, and Jamie kind of referred to, to this when he was talking. This is uh, my team, um, who really behind the scenes has, has set all this up. This, this takes a lot of planning, and um, you know this, this week has been kind of a crazy week for us. We're over here, we're back at the, uh, the office, we're back over here, and just trying to get everything perfect so when you come in, it's seamless, and hopefully that's the way it was today for you. So um, I just wanna thank my team, Jamie, uh, Nate, who's the IT guy here, and Nate's, or, and Jamie's team for, with UWGB, so. Thanks to them for making this happen. Who is here? Who's the presenters? I just think this is a, a cool uh, slide that shows 
how diverse um, and, and where you know, we have presenters coming from. Um, obviously Sheboygan, we have Green Bay, Fond du Lac, Ashwaubenon, Oshkosh. We have vendors. We've got Appleton, we've got Cami, we have Google, Fried Technology out of Texas, uh, Lego Education, New Line. I mean, looking at that, that's like an all-star team. And so we are so happy that they have joined us. They're a part of us. Many of them have been a part of us for many years. And I want to give a shout out to the attendees. I've got a lot of Fond du Lac people here and I want to say thank you <clears throat> to Fond du Lac. Um, that's where I started my career in Fond du Lac. So kind of close to my heart. Thank you for making the trek here to the Malibu of the Midwest. And um, we've got Sun Prairie here. We have Sheboygan Falls. We've got, we opened it up this year to some surrounding districts because we kept it inclusive. Now we're expanding. We want people to come here and just see what we do here in Sheboygan. So uh, thanks to all those who made the, the trek here. This is the schedule for the day. So after I get done babbling here, we're gonna have a little speech from Major Nathan Blackwell. Then we're gonna have something new, a tool slam. We're gonna have five people come up and just feature a tech tool, which is new. Then you're gonna get into your sessions, lunch, then your afternoon sessions, and then you wanna make sure that you come back for the end of the day. We've got some amazing stuff to give away. When you're finding your rooms for your sessions, these signs will be outside of the room. They will have which session is under session one, session two, and who the presenter is, just to help you navigate. There are signs as you walk out the door to get you to the other building, and then all of these sessions are in those buildings. So it's pretty easy to navigate. At the end of the day, notice we didn't have raffle tickets today. We are gonna do the spinning wheel for prizes, and so it's a huge wheel. There's 200 names on the wheel, so it's gonna be a lot of fun at the end of the day today. <laughs> I'm gonna introduce Nathan Blackwell, and this is one of the first times that I met Nathan this is what Nathan was doing. We were at a Green Bay Blizzards game. He delivered the game ball to the referee, and I like this high five. He's trying to do a high five upside down. It's time! There's the sound, it's a little delayed. So I'm going to invite Nathan up, he's going to give a few words, and then we're going to kick off the day. So Nathan? All right. Uh... <laughs> that just happened naturally. That, that's naturally. Every time I take the stage, it just yeah. the music follows me, whether they're speakers or not. Um, hey, uh, just real quick, th hey, thank you, uh, Mike, Jamie. Uh, can we give them one more round of applause? Yeah, yeah I, think it's, um, I think it's pretty impressive. I've uh, been able to kind of, kind of watch from a distance as, as Mike has really kind of put this together with his team. Um, and, and I think it's uh, pretty awesome that, uh, you know, um, sir, as you said, uh, that we're, we're spending a day to come in and, and refine ourselves as, as teachers um, and to prepare a better product for our students, because that's what it's all about. So uh, uh, real quick, a little bit about me. Uh, I grew up a teacher's kid down in Southeast Kansas. Uh, everybody's a teacher in here, so you have kids. Um, and I was not the typical teacher's kid student. Or maybe I was, I don't know. You can talk to me afterwards. Um, <laughs> straight A student, I think, uh, up through like about seventh grade. And then I started to ask that dangerous question, why? Why do I need, who, yeah, I'm getting some, you're thinking about that kid in your class right now, whether it's your own uh, child or not. So I started to ask that question, why? Why do I need to know this? And sometimes I would get the answer of, well, sometimes you just have to jump through the hoops, which we all know now, like, that's not something you ever tell a student ever, 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 ever. Uh, because I should have been told, like, well, you need this skill so that you're better at collecting information from making decisions. Because no one's going to pay you to be a dum-dum, you know, <laughs> without, without saying it that brashly. 
Uh, so anyway, uh, this is a picture of my mom and dad. Mom was a, a, a sixth and seventh grade social studies uh, and language arts teacher, and dad taught science and coached for a long time before he uh, became an administrator. Um, they both retired a couple years ago. Uh, dad's living his best life now, running a, a bus operation for a, for a district down in, in Missouri. Um, I put this uh, picture up there for no other reason that, uh, than I'm advocating now, because I plan on getting back on the football field and coaching here in about five years, maybe. Um, I'm, I'm advocating now for those shorts. We're doing shorts uh, from circa 1985. Uh, and that's me sitting on dad's shoulders. Um, and then uh, we fast forward just a few years here. That's, uh, I have two younger sisters. Uh, uh, one's four years younger than me, one's, one's about eight years younger than me. They were the ideal students. They made straight A's all the way through high school. as where I think I finished somewhere around a 1.87 uh, GPA, 17th from the bottom of the class. Um, mostly by choice. I was that student that would get the syllabus. Like, uh, well, there's 20 homework assignments. I'm not doing those. But if I do five, get a C plus on the final, I'll pass with a D. Right? <laughs> Who's got that kid in their class right now? <laughs> Just infuriating, right? Um, so, so anyway, um, I put this up here with my sister because she is now also a teacher. She teaches uh, high school English, uh, and she works in the same district with my dad and, and one of my aunts. Um, I have uh, two of my grandparents were also in education, and I think four, four out of my six aunts and uncles uh, also in education. So it's kind of a family business. So I don't want to say it was odd necessarily that uh, when I departed high school, uh, I was trying to do my best to get away from academia. I was just done with school um, and was a poor student by choice, just ignorantly by choice at age 17. And again, I know that we all know him. Um, but I put this up here, and, and for reference, uh, this is not for attribution. I did not get clearance from my mother to use these <laughs> photos. So we're going to kind of treat this like Vegas, what happens at Techno 2024. <laughs> I'm going to stay at Techno 2024. Uh, because even though I've been to combat a couple of times, I've done a lot of stuff in the Marine Corps, I still have a healthy fear of my mother. Uh, so looking at the Crayola family here in 1990-ish, uh, uh, I, I put them up here just because we, we've had a good time over the last couple of years talking about education uh, and uh, talking about uh, what inspires students and kind of examining, as a family, examining my own pathway uh, with education and uh, not only... Um, uh, academic success that I've had uh, post high school that nobody ever thought that I would have because I was, you know, I chose to be a poor student, uh, but also uh, the pursuit in teaching and my interest in teaching um, and how I was inspired um, in my experiences in the Marine Corps, my experiences uh, with some of the teachers and coaches that I had when I was in high school and college, and then also getting to watch my own family. And we've had some fun academic uh, discussions. And uh, when they start to make fun of my spelling and stuff like that and how poor of a student I was, I do remind my sisters that I was the only one of the three of us to graduate with a four-year degree in four years. Uh, they, they all went the extra mile uh, for a semester or two. And then I was the first one to get a master's degree, and no one ever thought that that was going to be the case in my family unit. Um, but anyway, uh, we have these discussions, and we come away with uh, uh, the realization that even though uh, to the points made just a little bit ago, technology has changed. The way that we, you know, we're on the back end of an information revolution is what I'm telling students and I'm telling people all the time. So the way information change has changed, the way that people absorb information and share information has changed. Um, and that, in, that influences teaching. That influences our teaching and our training everywhere, uh, in the Marine Corps, in our schools. Um, but the one thing that hasn't changed that we've said on, we have these discussions, and I think this is why, uh, even though I was running from academia to join the Marine Corps, uh, here in a few years, I'll be, you know, I'm going to say running from the Marine Corps. I've had a good career. I've enjoyed it. But I'm looking at getting back into teaching and coaching uh, because I have found an appreciation for it. Because the one thing that hasn't changed is education is a very human endeavor. And it takes connection. It takes real human connection, regardless of the technology that we have, regardless of the tools and training that we have. It takes human connection to inspire that student to own their own education. So the guy that was coming down that rope uh, learned that skill somewhere uh, in 2005. Uh, I think it was early 2005. I was in, be in between deployments uh, to Iraq. I had been accepted into a sniper platoon and um, uh, got to go to a bunch of different schools. And it was fairly intense. And when I checked into this school, uh, it was a three-week course, uh, very technical. Uh, I checked into the school, and majority of my peers uh, were either going through the course for the second time um, to get recertified, 
or had been put through a two-week preparatory course before they went to this school. Uh, most of them were also about four years older than I was. I was only 20. Uh, most of them were 24, 25, had been in the Marine Corps for about six years. And so I showed up on the first day and we started going through what we called rope corral and the instructors were walking up and down and they would say, okay, you have 30 seconds to tie a square knot with two overhands. Ready, rope. And you would have to tie this knot. This is the first time, you know, I'm standing there with a the rope um, and first time I'd ever had to tie a knot like that. Um, and so a couple of the instructors came by on that first morning and within about an hour, I could tell it was gonna be a rough three weeks. And uh, a couple of instructors tried to help me with a couple of things. And then finally, about the third instructor just kind of walked off and he said, hey guys, I think we got our 10 to 15%. This is the first one over here with thumbs. And they called me thumbs, which was the nickname for, I guess, a, a guy that couldn't call. They also called me not rock, which is a guy that can't tie. You know, so, so anyway, um, instantly I was like, oh no, this is, a, you know, uh, it, this is somewhat of a prestigious course. Not everybody gets to go through it, but if I fail, I have to go back to my unit in abject, abject shame. Um, so anyway, uh, out of nowhere appears this gentleman, and his name was Sergeant Santiago, and I'll never forget him. And Santiago stepped in front of me, and he said, don't listen to that stuff. It doesn't matter. We're here. I'm going to get you through this as long as you meet me with effort. And for the next week, when everybody would go home at about four or five, he stayed with me for two or three hours. And there was a couple of times where I was like, I don't know, man, I'm kind of tired. He's like, no, you're, you're going to get this. Because our first test was that first Friday. He's like, and I'm not, I'm not going to drop you on that first Friday. So he stayed with me and he invested with me. And when I was working on rigs, and it was fairly intensive, we had to learn 15 basic knots. You had to tie those uh, in a certain time limit. And then we had to learn uh, rigs for going off of towers and going off of the top of buildings and stuff like that. Um, and then, then there was also another six to nine rigs for going out of helicopters. It was, it was a lot that we had to, to learn, and they all had to be tied to a specific specifications because you're dealing with people's lives. Um, but I also noticed like, when, I was, when I was working at it, I would look over and he would be working on something else. He had some publications that he had gotten from some SWAT teams, that he had gotten some from, from some first responders, people that rescue, um, uh, rescue people off the sides of cliffs, so on and so forth. Not something that we necess necessarily do in the Marine Corps. And what I found was, he was, he was being a great, uh, a great teacher because his, his number one role that he viewed himself in was student. He was really putting in the effort to learn. And um, because of Sar Sergeant Santiago's efforts, I ended up graduating. I did just fine. I graduated with that course. Uh, was able to uh, um, participate and contribute in operations over the course of the next year. And then after I came home from my second deployment, uh, to Iraq, the decision was made that me and a few others were not going to uh, be allowed to go back to Iraq for a third time without spending some substantial time, su substantial time in the United States. And so uh, they assigned me to go be an instructor uh, at this school. And I went to go be an instructor at the school, and what I found was I was actually more effective as an as a instructor because of my struggles as a student. And I started to come away with more of an appreciation for teaching and definitely more of an appreciation for learning because I started to see, without even being able to verbalize it at the time, I was only 21, but I started to see that the struggle and the failure is part of the process, and that's okay. And I'd never felt like that before in any of my studies, anything in, acad in academics, um, so on and so forth. So when I checked in to be an instructor, they still talked about, hey, you know, we're gonna drop 10 to 15% of the class every time. And I kind of, I, I made a vow that, I was like, while I'm an instructor here over the course of the next year, we're not going to drop anybody. And we didn't. Uh, we put through about 135 students. We didn't have a single failure. And, uh, and I just did what Sergeant Santiago did. Whenever we had a student that struggled, I put in the extra effort uh, to learn how to communicate and connect with that student. And I think that's when I started to get bit by the bug uh, for teaching and coaching. Because I started to really appreciate uh, that spark and that flame that you see when you start to see people start to believe in themselves when they're doing something challenging that they don't think they can do and next thing you know they're doing it and they're doing it on their own and then they're surpassing not only their own expectation but then they're surpassing you and surpassing the expectation that maybe you had in their ceiling so I came away with that um, and I have a few quotes up here uh, that, that I think are relevant um, the first one up there Sergeant Santiago he, he established that it didn't matter what my skill level was on day one. He took the focus away from how bad I was at the skill 
And he focused on where we were going. Very important as a teacher. And then with his demonstration to me personally, and then also his demonstration he showed me as a student, I could see that he really cared for the, you know, the, the second quote up there from Teddy Roosevelt. The third one, the other instructors, I don't remember their names. I don't remember their names at all, but I do remember how they made me feel. They made me feel like I couldn't do it. They made me feel inadequate. Sergeant Santiago made me feel the exact opposite. And I've always tried to apply that in every single billet that I've had over the course of the last 19 years as a commanding officer in various billets. And then this, uh, this last one that I have, I think this is the, the inspiration that we all share uh, as we try to lead in classrooms. We try to lead through all the noise and all the obstacles uh, and everything that is facing our youth today. Uh, and make no mistake about it, you know, I, I have uh, uh, five children. Um, I know that the future is, is going to be challenging for them. You know, we're going to have to be, become uh, very industrious. They're going to have to be very, um, very quick, highly adaptable. They're going to have to know things. They're going to have to learn things. They're going to have to be able to communicate and work things out. And I think the very essence of, of what we do, and this is why I've always, you know, over the course of the last 15 years, when I have these conversations with my parents, I work for an organization of higher learning. And we very much are aligned with what our teachers are doing day in and day out uh, in our schools, which is just trying to get people to believe themselves and accomplish more than what they thought. Accomplish the extraordinary, which is the basic ordinary. But don't take my word for it when I say that's the type of organization that's kind of led me back into the classroom. One of our best kept secrets is twice a year I get to take educators out to uh, uh, San Diego. Uh, for, for a trip, it's a, it's a peek behind the scenes at our training and our education, uh, our life for our Marines, and how much we value the development of the individual, um, how much we really want to put into bringing that individual along um, and, and giving them the tools for success, not only in our organization, but for life in general. We start with the person, and it, start, it starts with the individual connection. Uh, so there's information there. We also have information um, out in front. I have a table full of lanyards and stuff. Please get rid of that stuff. I don't want to take it back to my headquarters. Um, and then there's some flyers out there. I'm willing to come and engage with students and tell my story and try to get them to buy off and own their own education and their own ownership because nobody's going to do it for you. I'm telling, I tell my kids and I tell my uh, Marines, I tell my students uh, all the time, no one can do it for you. Uh, you have to own your own education. If I want 26 inch biceps, I have to do the work to do 26 inch 26 inch biceps. If I want to read faster, then I have to put in the repetitions to read faster. If I want to get better at you fill in the blank, if I want to understand geography more, if I want to understand uh, uh, politics more, you, you fill in the blank, then I have to put in that work. And it's, it's about inspiration to get them to that, to that next level. So um, I'll wrap it up there. I don't want to go too long. If there's, uh, I'll open it up for questions if there's any questions for me. Yes, Lord. Yeah. Hi, I just wanted to talk about the educator workshop. I just came back from the educator workshop and it is absolutely life changing. Um, the opportunities that our students have. Um, I'm a college career and life readiness coordinator, so um, I moved from being a business and marketing educator and working with the recruiters, understanding how many different opportunities there are. But if you get a chance, first you get to go to California for a week and just like, it's amazing. But to actually see what they go through, and then it was actually life-changing for me. The Marines gave me the motivation and watching what those um, recruits went through that when I came back, I did some life-changing myself. And so I'm much healthier now because I went on that educator workshop, but mostly it's, you get to see the opportunities that the students have. So I just highly recommend it. If you have any questions, feel free to talk to me or talk to Major Blackwell, thank you. If there's no other questions for me, uh, I'm going to go change into a brewer's shirt that is Hawaiian themed and some shorts and get comfortable like everybody else. Um, yeah, uh, so Mike, um, Mike wanted me to explain a little bit uh, about the week. Um, it, is, it is a fast paced week. Um, it is not necessarily a vacation. Uh, however, we do have a good time, uh, but uh, we fly out. Uh, on, a, on a Monday, um, we get in uh, that Monday, we have a dinner. Uh, the next day, we, we get up in the morning, we have breakfast, and then we get on a bus. And you get to experience what our recruits experience uh, when they go to the Marine Corps Recruit Depot for the first time. Um, and uh, that first day is kind of some, um, 
environment setting so that you understand the recruits' perspective as they enter our training and education command at the basic level. Um, over the course of the next two days, uh, we'll go up uh, and visit Miramar. So you can see uh, Miramar Air Station, uh, get to look at some aircraft, uh, get more, um, uh, we'll, we'll, we visit the uh, education department up there so you can understand the, uh, the benefits that, that we offer to our, uh, to our Marines when it comes to pursuing education while on active duty. Um, and then we also go to Camp Pendleton, observe basic training uh, up there. We get to see an Eagle Globe and Anchor Ceremony, which is, uh, happens at the end of training. It's when a Marine, you know, it's when a recruit earns the title and is called a Marine for the very first time from the drill service. Very emotional. Um, yep, and that, the, the only people that get to witness that are, uh, are educators. There's parents that don't witness that uh, anymore. Um, and then Friday, we, uh, we wrap the week up with, a, uh, with observing graduation. And I've been through a lot of graduations, um, officer candidate school graduations in Quantico, uh, my own graduations in, in, in academia. There is not another graduation like Marine Corps Recruit Depot graduation um, in, in watching that. It is, uh, is awesome. The first time I took my wife, uh, we, were, we were actually watching from the other side of the, uh, the parade grounds, and she she was in tears just watching. Um, so uh, it, is, it is a great week. And then since we're coming back to Wisconsin, normally it's a late flight. So I have convinced uh, uh, people to let me allocate funds. We fly back on Saturday. That gives us Friday afternoon to visit Coronado Island and kind of do whatever we want. Uh, we're going to take a group, I think, in April this year. We're asking for um, a spot in February, a week in February, because some San Diego weather in the month of February coming out of the upper Midwest. It's a good break, um, and then. But I also know that uh, it's, it's sometimes it's a challenge to get away during the the, uh, the year. So I ask for a slot in the summer. So we take a group in June or July as well. Um, so uh, if you want more information on that, uh, you can hit us up. Um, Sergeant Toot is up in the back. He is the recruiter that's responsible for you and your students in the Sheboygan area, all the way up to Manitowoc, uh, over to almost to Fond du Lac and then almost all the way down to Cedarburg. Um, so he covers, he covers that area. Um, so you can ask him questions as well. But uh, like I said, don't take my word for it. Uh, I am running back towards, uh, towards academia uh, because of my experiences in the Marine Corps. Yeah, Jim. So Nathan, if you can explain to the educators and also probably their administrators who are wondering, how much does this cost? Who pays for this? I also had the privilege of going uh, to the educator's workshop in San Diego. And the officer one in Quantico, which was really amazing. So spending a week on you listening to officer side, but cost? How does that get bared? And for educators or administrators that are thinking, hey, I want some of my staff to go. Yeah. Who pays the cost? Okay, so we have somewhere around forty to sixty people that are going to apply. We can only take twenty, so it depends on how much money you give me on the table. <laughs> no. No. Uh, no. It's uh, It's no. It's no cost to you. Uh, no cost to you at all. You're actually paid per diem as well for meals because. We'll normally go somewhere for dinner uh, that evening. We'll go to a restaurant uh, that, that evening for dinner. Uh, breakfasts are provided and lunches are provided throughout the day. Um, so it's, it is, is no cost. Uh, and as long as you get out in front of it now, I know that getting substitute teachers uh, is, is kind of a, can be a pain. Like I said, my dad was a principal, so I've, I've seen that firsthand. Um, but uh, it, is, it is, like I said, it's one of our, we have a few best kept secrets. For educators, that's one of our best kept secrets. I highly Highly recommend, highly encourage it. And I actually let us shoot like crazy to give educators like the ability to shoot live rounds at a target. Yeah. <laughs> to, <laughs> the American taxpayer. Uh, so, yeah, no, it, it's, it's safe. Uh, we've never had anybody uh, seriously injured, anything like that. We do. do uh, <laughs> We sent the leg home in a cooler. I mean, it was fun. Uh, no, it, it, is, uh, it is for everybody of, of all skill levels. You don't have to be, you know, a lot of people are like, do I got to be like wicked CrossFit physically fit? No, uh, we, we do have the options for physical events, but if there's not, if there's not something that you feel comfortable participating in, you don't have to. We have other things that we can do. Um, and uh, like I said, it is a great week. We always get, we always get really great reviews. Um, and, uh, and, and like I said, like, don't, don't take my word and my message uh, for it, you know, my, my family and I, like I said, we, we do we do laugh uh, how you know 
the 17 year old kid who was like, I'm gonna be a gunfighter for the rest of my life. What am I, what do I need physics for? And then two years later, I'm like, oh, holy smokes, physics is a big part of long range shooting. Um, <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta be able to do math good. The math has gotta be mathing uh, for that. Um, you know, so, so anyway, we, we joke a lot and we, and, and we, uh, we have a good time. And I, and I really, uh, I look fondly back on my, just my, my experience and my, my journey uh, with the appreciation for education and trying to inspire people to be better than they thought they could. Like that's really, that's really what it uh, uh, amounts to. And that's why I've stuck around the Marine Corps as long as I have. And like I said, that's why I'm looking at teaching history and coaching football here in a few years. So, yes? Yes, so the question was, uh, is, it, uh, is it open for people in Wisconsin? Uh, so my area of responsibility, is a great question, thank you. Uh, my area of responsibility is majority of Wisconsin, Upper Peninsula, Michigan, I got a little bit of um, Illinois, and I got about half of Iowa. And we'll meet with groups from the rest of the Midwest. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure what stations will be coming with us, but there's a good chance that we'll go with probably Kansas City, uh, Kansas City Indianapolis, and Chicago. So there will probably be seven, eight states uh, where educators are kind of coming from all over. Um, normally there's about really 60 to 80. Do I still connect up with the group that I went with from, I have teachers from Wisconsin and also from Illinois that I still connect with and we Because you, you go through a lot. I mean, like you said, it's not a legit vacation. You, you get yelled at by the drill instructors. <laughs> <laughs> the yellow footprints, which has such a good history. You get to go to the museum, the history museum, I learned from that week, how much fun I had, and how much growth I had coming back. I personally did a lot of growth and change just from having that week. So if you, if you can get your admin to let you go, I would recommend it 150,000 times. <laughs> I, think, I think we have time for, for one more question, if there are any. Okay, and then, uh, then the last thing, I'll leave you with a stat and then we'll move, and, and I'll, be around, I'll be around all day. I'm gonna neglect everything that I'm supposed to be doing at the headquarters today. My operations officer and executive officer, they got it. I'd rather <laughs> hang out with educators uh, and learn something from you all today. Um, last thing that I'll offer is uh, um, only about one out of every 10 of our, of our youth are actually qualified for service today. However, our mantra in my station has been, and the thing that I'm talking to the recruiters about all the time, that doesn't mean we still can't have an influence on 100% of the population, and that's what we're here for. Uh, we, you know, plug into the community, how can you add value? Uh, and I have Marines all across my area, area um, all, all, every day that are working with youth to lose weight. This, this young man or woman is probably never gonna join our organization, uh, but we're helping them lose 40, 50 pounds. Uh, we're, helping, we're helping kids study uh, for, for ACT. We're helping kids, uh, you know, they're, not, they're not, uh, not looking to join our organization or they're not qualified. However, we're, we're running those types of uh, those events, you know, so we're, we're here to make an impact. So if there's something that, uh, if there's something that I can do to, uh, to help your school district, to help your classroom, to help your students, help your program, uh, I'm most effective in a history class, most effective with football teams, but I'll find a way, <laughs> I, will, I will find a way to, uh, to, to add value if I can. Um, there are flyers out there on that table with a, with a picture of me and my wife and, and our boys. Um, Grab one of those, take that, take that back to your, your building with you, um, and uh, my information on, is, is on there. Um, we're, here, we're here to support, we're here to help. So, um, if there's no other questions, I'll shut up and we'll get on with the day. <laughs> All right, hey, thank you for your time.